some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Look at me, Damien. It's all for you. Hello, mommy. Hello. We all go a little mad sometimes. Hello and welcome to a tremendous episode of All Things Horror. I am your host Ben and I'm joined here with my co-host Matt. If you're new to the show, each week we choose a movie to break down and review, we give our honest opinions and rate it from 1 to 10. We have a brief spoiler-free chat about the movie before heading into the plot and discussing our favourite and least favourite parts of the movie. This week we're going to be talking about The Evil Dead from 1981. But before we do, let's take a quick look at the trailer. No, it was the woods themselves. (laughs) They're alive, actually. your girlfriend, you take care of her. So five friends travel to a remote cabin in the woods where they play a tape with incantations. This releases the demons which possess them in succession until only one is left fighting for survival. Written and directed by Sam Raimi, main cast being Bruce Campbell, Ellen Sandwies, Richard DeManicor, Betsy Baker, Theresa Tilly. A uh, runtime of an hour and 25 minutes, and you're pretty much able to rent it anywhere. Um, very low budget. This was only uh, 375k. It's probably the lo- lowest budget movie I think we've covered on the podcast so far. Um, and I believe a lot of the funding for this was like crowdfunded, like through family and friends. I think, um, yeah, before crowdfunding was a thing, really. Like, just, you know, like you say, family, friends, mm. credit cards. Um, things like that. It's interesting that um, the budget for Spider Man was around 350 to 375 million. Spider Man oh, really? 3, I think it was. <laughs> so, like, if you, I don't, my, my maths isn't good enough, but that's more than 10 times, isn't it? The... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. The box office made 2.7 mil, so fair to say that they made quite a profit on this one. Uh, yeah, for sure. What's your take on low budget movies? Are you a fan? You got any favourites? Well, we covered. I was just thinking when you said that about price, I wonder how much it cost. I can't remember off the top of my head to make something like Host, because like yeah. that that's you know equally as inventive 
not in the practical effects side of things and you know like like in this putting cameras on broomsticks and running around kind of um way of doing it but in a sort of low budget way like 2020 low budget way Mm. um i think i think sometimes it makes them really effective because they feel more real they don't feel like a movie Mm. so like i think that makes it's like I think I mentioned it on the last podcast, but like, well, what should I spit on your grave? What worried me so much about it was it felt really real. Mm. If it was a big, big Hollywood multi million pound thing, then I would be able to be able, I'd be able to say it's just a movie. And as long as you get the, I suppose in things like Evil Dead, as long as you get the gore right and it kind of looks scary rather than funny, mm. and it is kind of funny to a certain degree as well, because that, but that's intentional. Yeah. Um, that it, it it's it's just so creative it's just so imaginative i i sometimes prefer watching a low budget horror not always but i can't think of many big budget horrors that are that are you know fantastic often they kind of find an audience something and then the sequel is bigger budget than the first one mm, yeah. um like friday the 13th is quite a low budget um but you know they, they get more money as they go along, and as the more popular they get, like the first Exorcist, I don't think was a massive budget. There's there's loads really, so I think it actually suits horror. Yeah, yeah, definitely, um, definitely. I really <laughs> enjoy seeing like the the creativity of what yeah. can be done on a on a small budget, because mm. sometimes like big budget movies, they take the easy way out with like CGI and huge, specially made set designs, but. Like you say, when it comes to horror, sometimes all you need is already right there in front of you. You know, it's just yeah. as effective. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I watched one shot on VHS that someone re-released recently called Slaughter Day. And it's two guys in Hawaii. They made a film. Basically, they'd seen a Evil Dead and they wanted to make their own version of Evil Dead, but like kind of based in Hawaii. And two like rad dudes like and they're filming it on a vhs camera on top of their shoulder and editing it for like from camera to camera um and doing the music live like playing music from tape like a tape <laughs> player as they did like everything is re- but some of the stuff that they did like the the stuff inside the cabin did remind me of evil dead and i was like it's so influential on people going oh i could do that oh yeah. i see how they did that i could have a go at that um, it's not as good, but it's fun. It's a fun film. It, it's like really silly film, mm. but um, it just shows you how good he, Evil Dead is and how good Sam Raimi is because he's then able to go on and then when he gets more money, he's more appreciative of it and uses it well. Mm. Whereas yeah, like, yeah. if you're going straight in making a massive movie, you might not appreciate that you could do this for a lot less. Mm. Now you say that, actually, it... it... I'm not sure whether this would be the film that started it, but it seems to be like some kind of small subgenre of horrors that is literally cabin in the woods type movies. Cabin in the woods, yeah. yeah. Like the film, like like with, I think they kind of commented on that, didn't they? A bit with the film Cabin in the Woods, which um, the the Drew Goddard one, and, yeah. Uh, and and I I wasn't like a massive fan of that. I felt it was a bit too up its up its own backside a little bit, and mm. and and uh, like not as clever as it thought it was. I know some people really, really liked it at the time, but I think we were in a period where everything was meta and everything was commenting on everything else. Um, uh, you know, because obviously they, they peel it all back and it's kind of like all controlled, isn't it, or mm. something like that. I can't yeah, quite remember yeah. now. But, like, it didn't do it for me. I'd much prefer watching someone earnestly trying to make a good movie, like like make their version of an Evil Dead kind of film. Mm. Um What's the one with the infection in the, oh, the cabin fever or something? Cabin like that? fever, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's quite a few of those in a. I think I watched the first one at the cinema. Um, I, I, I do like I do like anything where people are kind of trapped in small spaces. I mean, even something like Saw. Ninety percent of that first film is just in that one room. Mm, yeah. And what's that new one, the M. Night Shyamalan one? That That's a Cabin in the Wood type oh, one, Oh, yeah, with um, Dave Bautista in it. Yeah, that's recently uh, just come out, I think, this year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't think yeah, of that. Yeah, that's name. true. But that was a good no, one. No, I can't oh, think what it's called uh, either. Oh, but... A Knock at the Door or something? Knock at the Door, yeah. yeah. I was going to call it Cabin or something to do with Cabins. <laughs> but, yeah, um, 
Yeah, there's loads. There's so many. Yeah, knock at the cabin. It's knock at the cabin. Oh, okay. Yeah, I knew. I, I, yeah, we both between us, we got it right. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's, there's, it's, it is a subgenre, and it, it it's moving on from the kind of um, lakeside slasher mm. because it's demonic possession cross with slasher cross with gore. Mm. Um, so it, so it is it is a different take, and it is. Like this one in particular is very creative. I don't have a massive emotional connection with Sam Raimi films for some reason. I just can't. I try, but I can't get into them as much as I can other franchises or other directors. But I do appreciate he's very, very good. It's I... strange, really, because like I really like Ted Raimi, his brother, as an actor. I think he's brilliant. Like in he's in Intruder and um, Skinner, and he's an underrated, brilliant actor. I'm more of a Ted Raimi guy than I am a Sam Raimi guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean he has made quite a, a a good name for himself now. Like you say, he's done the. Uh, I think he did all three of the original Spider-Man movies, didn't he? Yeah, and yeah. and even. Lately, he's done the new Doctor Strange multiverse of madness. Yes, of course, yeah. Which yeah. I didn't think was too bad. I thought that was that was okay. I mean, yeah. it's hard now. We are at peak Marvel, um, where it's very difficult to keep people engaged with it because they've seen everything. It felt like it kind of ended with all the big Endgame kind of things. Mm. But yeah, he, he's been a producer on so many things, and he still continues to be a producer on things and like The Grudge and 30 Days of Night. And he's he's actually working with a lot of British creators as well. Like he's working with um, Jed Shepard and Rob Savage, who did Host. He's mm. like mentoring them. He was saying like, Jed Shepard's to me like he's like a, like a mentor to him, like somebody who he literally is on the other end of the phone with to... <laughs> Um, to get advice from. Oh, wow. He's a producer on the new uh, Boogeyman, Rob Savage one. Um, so he he's he is somebody who I think is very active in supporting other creators. Regardless, like he's done loads with like like um, action, not action, yeah, action like martial arts. Like that. he's been executive producer on things like Mar- um, Jean Claude Van Damme films and stuff oh, wow. like that. <laughs> It's a real, yeah, a real range of, real range of, uh, of, of kind of support for the film industry in general. Yeah. Like the Hercules TV show, he was like, um, an executive producer on that, and obviously he did Dark Man, which I think is pretty cool. I don't know if you've seen, have you seen Dark Man? No, I've not seen that one. That's that's pretty good. Um, they did like a thirty-minute pilot based on the film so they were going to make it into a tv series and they did a few like trying to make it into a tv series but it's like the original dark man with um liam neeson um mm. it's a pretty cool a pretty cool film <laughs> so yeah he's he's had a really great career hasn't he yeah still, yeah still is still is it's not like he stopped um i mean you mentioned obviously all yeah. the spin-offs from this film <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned this earlier about, about it being um funny kind of comedy do you reckon that was the intent for this movie to be a comedy? Because I know the second one and the third one, they really go for the the more comedic side of the comedy horror. I don't know whether this one was purposely trying to do that. I think so. I think so. In the same sense, like like I believe that the uh, Coen Brothers helped out on some of the um, editing. Mm. And when you think about it, like Coen Brothers films, although they are seen as very artistic and very, uh, very, you know, um, well-written, beautiful works of art, there is always a level of like folksy or hu- like quite down to earth humor in there that just kind of grounds the thing. Whether it's something like Fargo, there's some humor in there. Um, and, and I think Sam Raimi films always have, some sort of humor in there a subtle smart humor yeah just to remind you that like he's in on he's you you, it's very inclusive makes you feel like you're in on the joke too it's not like um it doesn't underplay any of the film doesn't make it any less scary Mm. or, or or worrying or doesn't ruin the story it's just I think it is intentional. I think it's intentional in all his work. I think that group of people are just very um, smart, funny people, and it and it's just an extension of their personalities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think there's a 
five in total across the franchise of the Evil Dead. Uh, the mm. TV shows aside, I think they've done a couple. But obviously this one, the Evil Dead, the Evil Dead 2, uh, Dead by Dawn, Evil Dead 3 is the Army of Darkness. And then they did the remake in 2013. And then obviously this year they uh, did Evil Dead Rise. What would you say is your favourite out of these? Or have you seen all of them? I, I haven't seen all of them. Um, one I've been really looking forward to is Army of Darkness. I've got that, and, I ha- and I'm waiting for the right moment to watch it. For some reason, I've always put it off. <laughs> uh, the second one didn't really do much, but then the first one, I had to watch it a few times before I really liked it. Um, Evil Dead Rise, I like the beginning and the end. I like the beginning kind of referencing the beginning of the original. Um, I like the end of it. Um, but... Like I said, I don't have a massive... It's not like a Friday the 13th where I could like rank them or Halloween where I could rank them and discuss them in that sense. Like, I'm not into, like... I've not seen any of the series. I do like Bruce Campbell. Um, but, like, I, he's really good in Bubba Hotep. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Bubba oh, Hotep, where he, yeah, play, he plays Elvis. <laughs> yeah, I saw that at the cinema. It's literally just me and one guy watching that film, and we thought it was brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, it... He's just like he's become an icon in the same sort of way as like a Freddy or a Jason, but he's one of the few that's actually a hero. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> as an icon, there's not many heroes in horror, is there? Well, the bad guys become heroes, I guess. Mm. I sometimes muddle up one and two because they're so similar, but um, yeah. I, it's like a remake, really, isn't it? It is kind of, yeah. I like the second one as it's stupidly entertaining. <laughs> it's literally this one, but they just turn it up to 11, like the chainsaw hand and the silly characteristics of Ash. Yeah. I was always... I'm, I'm always very stubborn when it comes to remakes, especially of classic, iconic horrors that I've, I've loved, I've grown up with. Um, I've always been that way when when whenever they do a remake even before i've seen it i go into it negative i don't know i'm growing up a bit now so i'm appreciating them more now but 2031 was good but yeah the evil dead rise i i watched that a couple of weeks ago and that was a good watch i actually really like that one it's hard isn't it to what to do to work out what what the purpose of a remake is sometimes Hmm. like is it exposing it to a new audience is it just making sure we don't lose the copyright? Is it making something new out of something old, putting a new spin on it? Hmm. Like, I think within 10, 15 minutes, sometimes you can go, oh, I know what this is and not need to watch it. Or, yeah. oh, this is really cool and really different. Like, I'm enjoying this. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I know what you mean. You go in with some, like, trepidation and thinking, oh, no, why are they remaking this? They don't need to remake this. Yeah. I, I, I find that more with foreign films, though. Like, like there's a film I love called Force Majeure, and they remade it with Will Ferrell. Oh. Um, and it was like a really dark comedy, very dark, pitch dark comedy um, made by a Swedish director. And then I was like, why if they remade it? Like, it's because people don't want to watch subtitles. That's mm. as simple as that. Like, it just... It's insane. So I get more frustrated with things like that than I, I can kind of understand if Sam Raimi's given his blessing and said to somebody, right, we're doing a remake of this film, and they've gone, oh, okay, cool. Like, let's mm. see what you can do with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've always kind of put this on the same shelf as like t- uh, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, just because mm-hmm. like both films, like cast and crew, they've been very open about the kind of living conditions on set and the filming conditions um and they both they're both so very like gritty and nasty where it actually makes me feel dirty after watching it where i want to go take a shower do you ever get like that (laughs) oh yeah there's there's definitely sort of grimy grimy ones isn't there like where everything looks a bit dirty or and, and the thing is with these a lot of them like, I think in, this is one. I'm not sure it's this one. It's like the exact opposite of Texas Chainsaw in a way, where Texas Chainsaw, everybody's really sweaty and hot mm. and yeah, yeah. dirty and horrible. And in this one, everyone's freezing cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> make it so, like, yeah. it, 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 you just have to get on and make the film regardless. There's no, like, it, it doesn't seem like it's a lot of fun to make, but probably a lot of but because you're doing it with your friends, you just kind of get on with it yeah. and get it done and no one's complaining. You know, maybe have a bit of a whinge, but get on with it. 
Um, like a filmmaker said to me recently, he was like, that's how he works out who to work with again, is if people are really excited about being in a film before it's made and like talk about being in a film and I'm in a film, but actually are whinging and complaining when they're making it, he's like, or not wanting to help or not wanting to get involved. And he's like, well, I don't want to work with that person again. Like they just like the idea of being in a film, but they don't like actually the the process. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas the people who get stuck in and do it. So I think in this one, like it's all friends and family, isn't it? Mm, it's yeah, all people yeah. that went to college with or, you know, um, brothers and sisters and things like that. And in a way it works quite well because they're all quite natural with each other in the car quite natural with each other, the, the banter. And then, like, you've got... Obviously, Bruce Campbell is, like, the one real, like, actor, I guess, in the, in the group. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was... Um, when I was gathering all my notes and all my trivia for the trivia section at the end, I learned a lot about this. And, yeah, I didn't even realise that Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, they were, they were good friends from high school, and they used to make mm. Super 8 films together all the time, kind of growing up. Sounds similar to the people hung around with um, John Carpenter, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, get all your pals together. Yeah. I mean, that's what it is, really. So if you don't have access to pay for all these things and, you know, you've got a group of people, it's creative people, it spurs on other creative people. Mm. Like, if I didn't talk to creative people about writing, I probably wouldn't write, if that makes sense. Mm. Or if somebody didn't say, yeah. oh, do it, you know, I wouldn't do it. So... <laughs> It helps, I think, to have that motivation. Like sometimes just have that one friend who's just like, oh, that's really cool. I enjoyed that. And then you'll do another one. So I imagine for Sam Raimi, he's remembered. Well, he has because you see the same like people pop up. He's always trying to get Bruce Campbell into his films, isn't he? Even mm. even like some of the big budget ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much all I've got. I mean... It was one of the highest rated video rentals of the year. I was with my dad the other day and he said um, he was 14 when this was made, so he must have been 15 by the time it actually came out on rental, wow. VHS. Um, but he told me back then they, they didn't always have the actual rating on the box. So no, he, he was, was able to... Thing, yeah, yeah, he was able to go in and he rented it when he was 15, him and his mate. And... Uh, they went back to his house and closed all the curtains so it was pitch black and they watched it and it scared the crap out of him. I bet. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I mean, because it escalates, it really does. It builds and it builds and it builds, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I remember watching it at university and it just having zero effect on me. And they're like, I don't know why people like that. My friend had like um, a special set of it where you had the Book of the Dead. Um, yeah. The Necrom Necronomicon um, leather-bound DVD mm. of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, he was really into it. It's like he was one of his favourite films, and like he loved Bruce Campbell. And I was just watched it, and I was really underwhelmed with it. So <laughs> I watched it again, second time liked it a bit more, third time liked it a bit more. Every time I've watched it, I've liked it a bit more. Mm, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, unless you've got anything else, we can jump into the plot and head into the spoiler section. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> right so five michigan state university students ash william his girlfriend linda his sister cheryl their friend scott and scott's girlfriend shelly vacate an isolated cabin in rural tennessee Approaching the cabin, the group notices the porch swing moves on its own, but suddenly stops as Scott grabs the doorknob. If there's one kind of takeaway from this movie, um, for all future filmmakers, it's the camera work. There, there's so much great cinematography in this film. Mm -hmm. they, they, they've probably given it an official name, but the, the first person view, when the evil is sweeping through the woods... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I bet that's kind of the first time something like that has actually been done. Yeah, I mean, we were talking a little bit before we were starting recording about Nosferatu, and like my thing with Nosferatu is like that's one camera, really, really heavy camera, and like moving it and getting it angles and the shadow and the light. And this is obviously many, many, many years later, 
like it's mounting it to things it's mounting it to sticks it's mounting it to broomsticks it's carrying it this way it's doing that it's just like kind of going right we want it to look like this how can we do that and it's the answer isn't like throw a load of money at it it's like think really inventively Mm, yeah so i i really appreciate it i think it's um it's really cool like how they do that well how they actually do that very first bit in the opening sequence when the evil is going across the pond that was sam raimi doing the shooting of the camera in a dinghy whilst bruce campbell was in the water actually pushing the dinghy along right right yeah i bet that is i bet a hundred percent that that isn't how they did it in the latest one (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) i mean the, the thing is now every film and some, I was speaking to somebody who made a Friday the 13th fan film and he was like, there's loads of fan films where they do like drone shots. Okay, the, yeah. But he, he deliberately, he could have done, but he didn't use drone shots. It was like, they wouldn't have been able to do that in 1981. They wouldn't have been able to do that in 1982. So it would look really out of place in a fan film based on that that film and i think that totally makes sense yeah in a way you know just because you can use something doesn't mean you should (laughs) no (laughs) yeah well like we said earlier sometimes it's better to just you know go with what you've got and not throw a load of cash at it to you know yeah even though even like later on with the music like it's all copyright free weird music like um the charleston and like music from uh, <laughs> probably like a hundred years or probably just under a hundred years before the film it's like it reminded me of insidious like yeah. using creepy music mm. um like i think this is a better film than insidious <laughs> <laughs> but it, it cost a lot of well, it probably cost a lot more money to make mm. i mean obviously you were just for inflation and all that kind of thing but like in a same, similar sort of way, when James Wan is making films, certainly like Saw, and you've not got that name and that money available, you have to think more creatively. Hmm. Um, and like you say, just the fact that you're paddling along on a boat or whatever is so cool. So funny as well, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So while Cheryl draws a picture of a clock, the clock suddenly stops and she hears a faint demonic voice tell her to join us. Her hand becomes possessed, turns pale and draws a picture of a book with a demonic face on the cover. Although shaken, she doesn't mention the incident. The the way she just kind of plays it off after that happens, she was like, huh, that was weird. My hand's not done that before. (laughs) That was a bit odd. (laughs) During dinner, the cellar trapdoor flies open. Shelley, Linda and Cheryl remain upstairs as Ash and Scott investigate the cellar. They find the, I hope I say this right, Naturom de Monto. Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying it, so yeah. That's <laughs> a Sumerian version of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Along with archaeologist Raymond Nobis tape recorder. And they take the items upstairs. Scott plays the tape of the incantations that resurrect a demonic entity. Cheryl yells for Scott to turn off the tape recorder. And a tree branch breaks through the cabin's window. Yeah. So uh, this is where I get a little lost. Because my understanding, it's always been the tape that kind of summons the demons. And that's what starts it all. Yeah. But we've already been seeing some weird shit happening. Like the POV kind of evil roaming through the woods. The porch swing, oh, trapdoor, yeah, Cheryl's hand point. gets possessed. You know, but... Is there any logic to this, or is it just something to make the movie look better? So is it, yeah, so there's something already waiting. I guess there's always something um, already there, something there waiting to be released. Almost like knocking, I don't know, like knocking at the door almost. Mm. Um, I guess. Just like bubbling under the surface. I don't know. I'm trying to work it out. I'm not sure. I never thought about that until you just said it. Um, Mm. Like you could have. So, yeah. Like you could have like a haunted house, but once you're doing a Ouija board, you tend to open it up to bigger things. Yeah, yeah, like releasing those. Mm. A bit like opening that 
thing on the trap door or what have you, like, but in a sort of a figurative way. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Know. Hmm. Mm. Let's have. We'll, we'll say that's what it is, but yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Something I found interesting. By the way, I've got so much trivia. You go on IMDb, and it's just like hundreds and hundreds of like facts and stuff about this movie. So I've kind of thrown <laughs> some throughout the plot. Um, one thing I found quite funny was when they were first listening to the tape. Um, the original script actually called for the actors to be smoking weed, and right. They de- they decided to try that for real, but the entire scene had to be reshot later on due to their you know, uncontrollable behaviour. <laughs> right, yeah, that would make sense. They, they weren't, yeah, they weren't able to actually focus on what they were supposed to be doing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, they've got a good relationship between them all. You can tell they all know each other and they're all friends. That goes a long way in a film like this. Yeah, um, building characters. There's some of the some of the little things the same feel very natural. Hmm. Um, very realistic, and it's a small it cast well. as well. There's only five of them. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so later that evening, an agitated Cheryl goes into the woods to investigate strange noises, where she is attacked by demonically possessed trees. Yeah, that's weird. That is a, is a weird scene. Hmm. Um. In the apparently in the script it wasn't to be as sexual as it was, mm. um, so a bit of a surprise for her. Whether that was intentional or not, I don't know. With them all being friends, I I don't think it's the case of like the director surprising you with things you don't want to do. Probably mm. just a bit of the just learning how to make a film. Um, I think with it being so cold out there as well, it must have felt horrible yeah. for her. <laughs> I think Sam Raimi does kind of regret that scene now. I think he's opened up saying that he kind of regrets putting it in there. Yeah, I think the problem is mid to late seventies. This is the sort that's the sort of thing that almost felt like had to be in movies. Like I said before about things like Last House on the Left or um, Night Train Murders, I Spit on Your Grave. There's always an element of like assault in there. Yeah, and yeah. I think I think it's main. I think it's because of um, reflecting society and like dehumanization and things that they'd seen and read in the news relating to Vietnam. Uh, I really do think it's that kind of uh, you know real life bleeding into into things. I think that people were getting were very disturbed by some of the things that were coming out of of that and still dealing with it. Um, yeah, and also I think maybe they thought that's how grindhouse films and lower budget films were sold. There had to be some sort of sexual element for it to work, and not not in a kind of harmless way of just somebody accidentally losing their clothes, but like something horrible having to happen to them. Mm. So yeah, I'm, I didn't know that he'd said that, but yeah, it could do without that, or it could certainly do it in a different way. She could be tied up and trapped and. It could go into her ear or her nose or her eyes or something and be just as scary and horrible. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it needs to be like the way it is. So, yeah, I agree with Sam Raimi. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably the most fucked up I'm scene in the film. But um, All kinds of stuff in this film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this scene actually resulted in it getting banned in most countries. And as, as far as I'm aware, I think it is still banned in some. I'm not sure where. But yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely a hard scene to watch. Like any rape scene, it, it's, it's it's a bad time for viewers. <laughs> and personally, I, I can't yeah. watch I can't watch anything like that. I always tend to look away. But um, throw in a demonic tree in the mix, kind of makes it feel even more kind of gross and dirtier. But um, yeah, I guess you can you can say it's more of a movie. You can say it's a movie, like, because that doesn't happen in real life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, um, Mary Whitehouse used this as an example of the video nasty in court. So, oh, okay. like, whether she, I wonder which parts she showed to, mm. to, to kind of illustrate. Because I think there's other films, I certainly know of other films in the video nasty list that would have been much more offensive and much worse to watch than this. Whether it was just the chopping of the limbs and things like that Hmm. that's quite gory 
I guess you could just pick one of a load of films and say, look how bad this is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like to choose this one, which is one of the better made in the list, mm. is a strange one because yeah. there's some artistry and creativity. But then I guess people just don't oh, want to see that, do they? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, when she escapes and returns to the cabin bruised and anguished, Ash agrees to take her back into the town only to discover that the bridge to the cabin has been destroyed. Cheryl panics as she realises that they are now trapped and the demonic entity will not let them leave. Back at the cabin, Ash listens to more of the tape, learning that the only way to kill the entity is to dismember a possessed host. As Linda and Shelley play spades, Cheryl correctly calls out the cards without looking at them, succumbs to the entity and levitates. In a raspy, demonic voice, she demands to know why they disturbed her sleep and threatens to kill them. Different kind of demonic voice from Exorcist, but in the same sort of vein. <laughs> I really like I really like this demonic voice. It's, yeah. it's, it's so brilliantly done. It's like they've layered multiple recordings in different pitches. You know, it's very effective. I, I really like it. It's quite it. funny in a way as well. Yeah. Like some yeah. of the stuff she says. Because they're so bold as brass and like right in your face with what they want and what they're saying. Yeah. They're like quite... It's a bit like uh, The Exorcist in that sense where there is there is some humour there as well because yeah, it's, dead, yeah. it's dead blunt, isn't it, the stuff they're saying. And they're, like, they're, they're taunting you and making fun of you. They're actually having fun. Yeah. It's even, even more scary, it's, you know, something's destroying you and having fun. And that goes back to some of those films in the 70s we were talking about. Some of those are really scary because the people doing the horrible things are having loads of fun while they're doing those horrible things. Mm -hmm. That's scary. goes back to, I'm sure I've said it in other episodes, goes back to that kid at school who you'd stay away from because they would do really weird, horrible stuff, but they do it with like a big smile on the face. <laughs> like those are the ones to stay away from, mm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so Cheryl stabs Linda in the ankle with a pencil and throws Ash into a shelf. Scott knocks her into the cellar and locks her inside. Um, everyone fights about what to do. Having become paranoid upon seeing Cheryl's demonic transformation, Shelley lies down in her room but is drawn to look out of her window, where a demon crashes through and attacks her, turning her into a deadite. She attacks Scott before he throws her into the fireplace, slashes her wrists and then stabs her in the back with a Sumerian dagger, apparently killing her, when she reanimates Scott dismembers her with an axe. Ash and Scott then bury her remains. Yeah, there's, there's, there's... lots of good moments with, with Ash, like, wondering what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's some absolutely great practical effects in, in, in this movie, but um, some of which 100% still hold up today. Like, for example, the, the stabbing of the ankle with a pencil. Every time I watch that, it always makes me cringe. It because it, it it does it looks really real it it legit looks like he is actually stabbing into her foot and they like twist it around and normally with a scene like that you're on it briefly you know it's like a quick shot but they pat they zoom in right on her foot for a solid ten seconds while she's like squirling it around in in her foot yeah it's um some gnarly stuff <laughs> yeah <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, i don't think there's a lot of things you could compare it to at that time i think you know people have really gone to um gone to new it's it's took sort of practical effects to a new level hmm. Hmm. i know we can talk about you know tom savini and people like that yeah but there's something times a hundred Buckets of blood, kind of thing, with Sam Raimi. I think that may, that, that maybe makes it stand out for people. Mm. Yeah, the the term deadite. That's something that's specifically related to this franchise, isn't it? I was gonna say, yeah, they gave them the 
creatures a specific name which i think allows you to build your own little mythos of it and yeah it's separate it's not like it's just another zombie film or just another possession film or it's like they're not quite this and they're not quite that but they are deadites Mm, mm. um which i think is good because it doesn't when people talk about zombie films and when they talk about possession films they don't mention either of these (laughs) <laughs> they, this is it kind of does its own does its own thing it is yeah yeah which is really hard to do in horror to find your own you know it's not just another wolfman movie or another vampire movie or another this you know it's something to find mm. your own spin on it your own take on it is really it's probably even harder now um yeah, you know yeah it's like oh i'll do a clown oh no we've done those <laughs> it is literally it, isn't it yeah. Yeah. it's like yeah. a an undead <laughs> demon yeah, it, uh, it's it, it ticks none of the boxes, uh, yeah. but all of the boxes at the same time. <laughs> it's um, it's very creative, and I, I don't know how he came up with that. Maybe from reading Lovecraft and kind of putting his own spin on some of those things, because a lot of people, particularly at that time, got a lot of their ideas from Lovecraft. You know, you look at obviously Reanimator because that's from a Lovecraft story, mm. but um, he's he's so influential on so many people even now um but again i don't think it ties in fully with this this is very much a sam raimi idea isn't it it's like very much his own creation yeah doesn't the necronomicon that comes from uh hp lovecraft doesn't it is that it some, does, yeah. something he made yeah. up yeah yeah that's right um yeah i mean you can buy for quite cheap really nearly all his works and it's just so dense i got the complete works of but because my eyesight's so poor i got it i was like oh this is really cheap the complete works of but it was like a like a six point lettering to fit everything in <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know like uh, was it chitulu and all yeah. those things like all of them and they were all there but i was just like i can't read that it's too small <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, shaken by the experience, Scott decides to leave in order to find a way back to town. He returns shortly after, uh, wounded from the possessed trees, and dies whilst warning Ash that the trees will not let them escape alive. When Ash checks on Linda, he's horrified to find out that she has become possessed. She attacks him, but he stabs her with the Sumerian dagger. Yes, she is probably the creepiest one, the creepiest deadite out of all of them, because she just kind of sits there and giggles at everything. It's weird. It's like, you know, like when you get a ghost child, <laughs> it's, it makes it <laughs> ten times worse. <laughs> it's, um, I was just thinking as you were saying that about, you know, doing things on a budget. I guess one of the reasons people use Lovecraft so much is because it, it's in public. I think it's all in public domain. So, like, mm. don't have to pay. So you can use the Necronomicon. You can use all these things. Yeah, pay true. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, um, then you can go to town on it, and there's so much to use there. But, yeah, she's super scary. Uh, and I, in, in the in the latest one, the first, was it 15, 20 minutes, with the girl in the bed, um, who you think she's just kind of reading a book or got a cold or something. And then her, I think it's her sister goes over to see how she is. Oh yeah, and then she's like, yeah. That reminded me a bit of this. Like that was actually really well done. That was actually quite mm. scary as well. Mm. Yeah, I think um, during the scene where possessed Linda attempts to stab Ash with a dagger, Betsy Baker actually had no idea where he was because the heavy white contact lenses prevented her from actually seeing anything <laughs> so she was literally blind <laughs> i think i read so- okay. something about um the actors because i think they've they, well apart from bruce they all had to wear them but um yeah the actors said that it was so bad for their eyes that they, they were reduced to only wearing them for like 15 minutes a, at a time yeah mm. it's um something that kind of eye related stuff people didn't seem to be very careful with them back then mm. like think of like clockwork orange you know like scraping and pulling his eyes and mm. oh my word speaking of somebody who wears contact lenses and has issues with his eyes uh yeah i feel i feel for these people yeah yeah <laughs> and something else as well 
kind of kind of on the same thing but um Bruce Campbell he he twisted his ankle on a route whilst running down a steep hill and mm. it's at some point during the filming but um Sam Raimi decided to tease him by poking his ankle with a stick quite often and that and that caused uh Bruce to have quite a quite a big limp and you can see it in mm-hmm. some of the scenes I think more towards the end where he's limping quite a lot that's like a real limp that he's got because it of works Sam. though doesn't it <laughs> yeah it works yeah, really yeah. well yeah it's like when you're just all beat up and tired and stuff you'd limp wouldn't you yeah um it's a uh, it's so, something that I guess only a friend could get away with <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah not every director can go up with a stick and start jamming your cast. No, I can't ankles. imagine he'd be very popular. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. William Freakin would do it, but when he was a young man, but yeah. <laughs> throw you over the other side of the room and smash you into a wall. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, unwilling to dismember her, he buries her instead. Um, she revives and attacks him, forcing him to decapitate her with a shovel and then retreats back to the cabin. Back inside, Ash discovers that Cheryl has escaped the cellar. Surprise, motherfucker! (laughs) Cheryl eludes Ash and attempts to choke him. Ash escapes her grasp, then shoots Cheryl in the jaw. As Ash is barricading the door, Scott reanimates into a deadite. Scott attacks Ash and inadvertently knocks the book close to the fireplace. Ash gouges Scott's eyes out and pulls a tree branch from Scott's stomach, causing him to bleed out and fall to the ground. Cheryl breaks through the trapdoor and knocks Ash to the floor. Yeah, there's there's a lot of action-packed stuff in this scene. I was just thinking, there might not be a lot of different locations, but Mm. there's a lot happening. There is, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, what do you reckon of all the practical effects? It's it's starting to get really effects heavy towards the end, like when he's gouging his eyes out and stuff like that. What do you make of all? Yeah, all this I'd stuff? forgotten about the the eye gouging. I seem to forget a little bits of each of films when I watch them from time to time and go, oh yeah, that, oh yeah. Mm. Um, I, I one thing I do like practical effects wise in this, I I think the axing is really effective and and quite good. Mm. Um, the, the sort of the chopping and the relentlessness of it, like it goes on a little bit longer than it would in most films. Mm. Uh, yeah. So I think that works really well. I think most of the things actually go on a little bit longer than they would in most films. Therefore, that I guess that's what makes them work so well. Yeah, yeah. You um, you also see Ash go down into the cellar for to get some more shotgun shells, and there seems to be um like blood just coming out of everywhere like blood is like coming out of the yeah. plug sockets and the light bulbs if there's one thing they go hard on it is it's the blood i think they i think i read they used around about 300 gallons of fake blood i think at one point it was the most amount of blood used in a film i have a feeling that um damien leone of terrifier made a note of whoever had the most and made sure that they had more. <laughs> <laughs> that was his plan. But what do you expect from somebody who was literally named after Damien the Omen? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> was spelt the same way. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think for one I think for quite a long time this was the gold standard when it came to buckets of blood. Not the film Buckets of Blood, which is also a really good film. <laughs> um But yeah, uh I should it was have definitely at the top of the table. I should have made a note, but I, I did read something about the fake blood that they had. I think they had to do a couple of drops of blue dye in it to kind of um, give it a darker tone. Something to do oh. with the ratings of it. it. It lowered the rating a little bit if it if it didn't look like too much like blood. I wonder, I, yeah, if you think about like Hammer Horror and the blood in there just looks like paint, mm. like bright red paint. Um <laughs> And what the purpose of that was, just to make it unique. To we know it's a Hammer film. I don't know. Yeah. People say to me, "Oh, I've had people say to me, oh, I just love Hammer blood.' <laughs> <laughs> it's like they have a favourite type of blood." <laughs> yeah. There is um. There's one scene around here. I'm not sure exactly where it is, 
but apparently the cameraman slipped over and knocked a couple of Bruce Campbell's teeth out. I think it's like a zooming in shot of uh, of when uh, the camera's coming at Bruce's face and he's trying to shut the door. I think the cameraman slipped over and hit him in the mouth. Oh, wow. I mean, again, these, these low-budget films, there's a little bit of a... <laughs> danger element <laughs> yeah well i mean if you got 300 gallons of fake blood on the floor i can imagine someone's gonna slip over at some point <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay all right getting towards the final act now so as scott and cheryl continue to attack ash on the ground ash grabs the book and throws it into the fireplace while the book burns the deadites freeze in place then begin to rapidly decompose Large appendages burst from both corpses, covering Ash in blood. The bodies of Scott and Cheryl then completely decompose. Dawn breaks and Ash stumbles outside. As Ash walks away from the cabin, an unseen demon moves rapidly through the forest, rushes through the cabin and attacks him as he screams in terror. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's my dog, my dog screaming in terror right now. Yeah, right on cue. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I was saying just before that last final act, you get a lot of uh, special effects. They get really heavy towards the end, especially in that very, very last scene. I think it is it called claymation in that final scene. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, where they're all decomposing. I know for this day and age, it, it probably wouldn't look good for like a younger audience where it's like a first watch but as a kid for me i thought it was excellent and i still do i, I enjoy anything like that I yeah thought... that sort of stuff is a bit like um the ray harryhausen stuff you know like jason the argonauts and all that kind of thing it's like yeah. actually it still stands up as looking really cool and unique now yeah like you know people forget they use little models in star wars you know it's not everything <laughs> cgi doesn't always mean better <laughs> well especially for what they're actually the purpose of it in that final act is literally decomposing of a body yeah um it works really well i believe the claymation effect in this scene is what used a lot of the budget up. I, f I think Sam Raimi said that that is what took the most amount of time to achieve. Yeah. I, I don't I know what goes so. into it, but I can imagine Especially that takes a long time. For the first time. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing it himself, or maybe he learned it at college, or I don't know, who knows <laughs> how he came up with that idea. But it was very, good, very, very interesting, very yeah. different, unique. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and rate this film. So... One to ten, Book of the Deads. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is... It's an iconic movie. It's, you know, uh, Sam Raimi, he's now a very respected director. I find it incredible when movies are able to do so much on such a small budget, and I feel it, it's a... It's good in a way that it forces them to kind of think outside the box and utilise what they have around them. I think regardless if this is one of your favourites or not, it's going to be... There's going to be at least one thing that you take away from this movie where you think, wow, okay, all right, that was pretty cool. Or something scary that lurks in the back of your mind. Um, this film I've grown up with, so I'm sure nostalgia plays a part. But honestly, making my notes and doing my research for the trivia section has actually made me like and appreciate this film even more. Discovering things that happen behind the scenes, how certain scenes were made and the friendship, uh, friendships and uh, be between the cast and crew. I was going to give it a 7.5, but due to the added knowledge for the episode, I've, I've bumped it up to a solid 8 out of 10. Ooh, okay. Wow. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> All right. So, like I said before, I'm not like a massive Sam Raimi fan. I appreciate him as a filmmaker. I know he's a very good filmmaker, a very good advocate for other filmmakers. Inventive, low-budget film, this one in particular. Um, you know, the practical effects, as we said, fantastic. I'm probably more of a Ted Raimi guy, <laughs> like <laughs> like him as an actor. But, um, 
I, I, I seem to like it a little bit more every time I watch it. At the moment, I'm up to 7 out of 10 for this film. Okay. So I'm going to give it a good solid 7 out of 10 for this film. Awesome. All yeah. Right. That's cool. Books of the Dead. <laughs> All right. Let's head into our trivia. Trivia. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, like I said earlier, I was I was overloaded with trivia, so I've I put a lot in the plot, but I've kept a lot of the cool stuff for this bit. So, um, Andy Granger, a friend of Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi, uh, gave them this advice: uh, "Fellas, no matter what you do, keep the blood running down the screen." They included the scene in the finished film where the blood runs down the projector screen as a tribute to him. Yeah, that that was one of the scenes where he goes down into the basement in it, and there's just blood just coming from everywhere. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely don't don't skimp on the blood. Absolutely not. So the cabin used as the film set was also lodging for the thirteen crew members, with several people sleeping in the same room living conditions were terrible and the crew frequently argued the cabin didn't have plumbing so the actors went days without showering and felt ill frequently in the freezing weather by the end of production they were burning furniture to stay warm and i think as well they were burning like um some of the set like some of the uh, props and stuff I know that the the only deal about using the cabin was it had to go back to exactly the way it was before they went mm. there, and most of it they could return to how it was. Some of it they could not. <laughs> Whether they burned any of it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, certainly I heard that it was ridiculously cold for them, so I do feel for them for that. Mm, yeah. Uh, at the end of principal shooting in Tennessee... Uh, The crew put together a little time capsule package and buried it inside the fireplace of the cabin as a memento of the production to whoever found it. The cabin has since been destroyed and and only the fireplace is still intact. Mm -hmm. I bet that's creepy, just to have a fireplace there in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) But it's like we said with the thing, you know... Um, when I met the guy last year um, and he was like, oh, yeah, we just went to the set of the thing and took all the stuff and brought it away because nobody had touched it. It just was left there for years and years and years. <laughs> so, like, um, if you're willing to go to these places, <laughs> you can get yourself uh, some nice pictures and some nice um, mementos. Yeah. Sell it on eBay. <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I really like this one. So Bruce Campbell put up his family's property in northern Michigan as collateral so that Sam Raimi not only could finish the film, but also blow it up to a 35mm film, which was required for a theatrical release. Raimi was so grateful for Campbell's financial contribution that he credited him as a co-producer. Yeah, so he should. Yeah. That's ridiculous, putting somebody's house. To be fair, that's <laughs> not a good idea. That That is not... Yeah, that's a great friend. Yeah, um, yeah. Like we said earlier, they've been friends since high school, so... Mm. But, yeah, I don't know, man, if that's a, a, good, um, a good idea, but it works out for them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, ow, this is what I was talking about earlier. So... The blood is a combination of caro syrup, uh, non-dairy creamer, lots of red food colouring, and one drop of blue food colouring to darken it. At one point, Bruce Campbell's shirt that he wears in the film was so saturated with the fake blood that after drying it by the fire, the shirt became solidified and broke when he tried to put it on. Mm. (laughs) Wow. It's um, so much goes into me. I don't think there is one way, is there, of making blood for movies? There's like so many different ways. Yeah, yeah. Okay, last one. So during the scene where Ash is about to cut up his girlfriend with a chainsaw, Bruce Campbell actually had to use a real chainsaw and hold it up to the actress's chest 
you can see on the close-up of Linda's neck, looking at her necklace, that her pulse is racing. Yeah, and he, he does get really, really close with her with that chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, you feel like maybe, um, again, there's no safety rules or, nah. you know, stuntmen or people who have made movies before. <laughs> well, it was just 13 of them out in the middle of nowhere in a cabin, so <laughs> it's not a lot that went into making this movie. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's all the trivia I've got. So, Okay, so let's head into this week's game. Okay, this is the Evil Dead quiz. <laughs> I'm going to test your knowledge on the Evil Dead and yeah. see how much that you was paying attention. <laughs> Just on this film, not the whole franchise. Just then. this film, yeah. Oh, man, okay. And no looking at notes or Google. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> so what relationship is Cheryl to Ash? Uh, sister. <laughs> that was in my notes, but I didn't read it. <laughs> uh, in what state does the Evil Dead take place? Um, now I'm gonna. It's either Washington or New York State. I don't know. Uh, New York State. This what? takes place in Tennessee. Oh, oh yeah, I said that earlier on. <laughs> <Nevermind>. <laughs> is that where it's filmed in Tennessee, or is that not? I think it is. Uh, uh, thought, or is it? I oh no, have... uh, Michigan. Oh, okay. Yeah, Michigan. Oh yeah, yeah. Marshall, Michigan, Morristown, Tennessee. So some of it is filmed in Tennessee, but some of it's in Detroit, Michigan. Oh, in fact, all over the place. <laughs> Knox, Knoxville, Tennessee, Detroit. Michigan, Morristown, Tennessee, Marshall, Michigan. Yeah, a mixture of the two. Oh, right. Oh, okay. It's interesting. Um, what forebodying event happens to the five youths on their way to the cabin? Um, so, like, something to do with the radio in the car or something? Mm. No, so they lose control of the wheel and they oh, yes. almost go head to head with a truck oh yeah yeah oh yeah i remember that banter in the car or the interactions between them in the car is actually really good yeah uh what can be seen on the wall in the cellar um there's something in particular that stands out on the wall um I don't know. A painting? <laughs> not quite. <laughs> so, um, I know you're not big on picking up Easter eggs, but there is a poster of The Hills Have Eyes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I read that. Totally forgot, though. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who goes down to investigate the noises in the cellar first? Oh, um, the other man. The other man. <laughs> Um, whose name escapes me <laughs> who's not the non-Bruce Campbell man the non-Bruce um, Campbell alright I'll give you that yeah <laughs> I know who you Scott. mean Scott Scotty yeah <laughs> uh, what kind of pendant is on Cheryl's necklace is it um, a um, what's those things called that the um, pentagram pentagram yeah a cross. A cross. No. <laughs> it's a oh, magnifying glass. Oh, okay. <laughs> not not quite the same as a pentagram. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one. Um what is the name of the book in the cellar? Book in it, the cellar. Uh, oh the what, the Necronomicon or Uh well, yeah, but in the movie they call it something else. I struggled what, with book, the name on it earlier. Book. Not the Book of the Dead, then, no. no. Um, it, I don't know. It says it on the tape recorder. Uh, the 
Naturom Dimonto. Oh, okay. And that translates to Book of the Dead. Oh, fair enough. Hmm. Yeah, cool. <laughs> that, I'm that. not very good. I'm not very good with the Evil Dead. <laughs> uh, all right, that's I, this week's I was game. waiting for the Halloween three quiz. <laughs> <laughs> we might do um, better next week on our wrap up. Right now, we're gonna be doing next week Chopping Mall. Yes, and that is another film that I have never seen before. I love it. I think you're gonna hate it. Oh really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think if you disliked Halloween three, I think you're gonna hate this. Um, yeah. Tim Wynorski, um, like the poster as well. Some of the posters don't look anything like the actual, like the the robots in the film. Oh, okay. um, and there's not a lot of chopping. But if you can kind of get past that, it's a lot. I think it's a lot of fun. Like it's it's just fun B movie. It's a real B movie, hmm. but. I love it. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, I've been looking forward to that. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> You're still yet to have a 10 out of 10. I was looking at all of our uh, ratings. The highest you've done is a 9. Is that The Exorcist? Uh, yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, I've probably close. I think it's close to being a 10. Um, maybe some others, like, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard for me to give a 10. We'll get there one day. Know. Yeah, so maybe some of the um, Roger Corman. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe ones I really do like a lot, um, especially after watching recently the I've started watching the Mike Flanagan um, Fall of the House, House of Usher, hmm. and I'm in the minority where I'm not a massive Mike Flanagan fan and I'm not that taken with it. <laughs> um, so maybe I'm just very old fashioned. Maybe the older, the further back we go, the more likely we have to get a ten. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. All right, well, the poll pick is up, um, and that is for found footage movies. So we've oh, yeah. got Paranormal Activity, The Visit, and Unfriended. I, I have already voted. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen neither of I've I've seen neither of them. I've seen none of the three, so... Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I haven't uh, checked I, since last night, but from what it was last night, I think Unfriended was winning... I think at the moment oh yeah it is i voted for unfriended only because i've never heard of it i think i know what it is i think it might be like a facebook one yeah it's the one I'm thinking of with like john cho or someone and his daughter goes missing or maybe i'm thinking of something else uh, um yeah it, you really liked host and i think it's quite similar to that okay mm. well the visit is an m night Shyamalan film isn't it uh yeah i think it is yeah Ansel yeah. and gretel kind of thing mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Paranormal Activity I have not seen. Ooh. And is that is Ryan Reynolds in that? Oh no, it's the Amityville Horror. No, um, no. Or the Amityville, one of the Amityville ones. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know about that Paranormal Activity. I've seen lots of spoofs of it. Yeah, yeah. I really liked it. I thought that was really good. Oh shit! A ghost! That's pretty much it the whole way through. Is that from the film? <laughs> no. Because <laughs> <laughs> if it is, the acting is incredible. Uh, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That'll be me in that situation. All that's right. True. Yeah, cool. Get voting. Um, yeah. And that's it. Any yeah. of those films will be films I've not seen. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'll be happy, equally happy with them. I don't mind. <laughs> cool. All right. If you've liked today's episode, be sure to go and like us on Facebook. That's where we announce our next episodes, as well as each month doing a themed poll pick where you get to choose what you want us to watch. We like to hear from you, so please feel free to leave us a comment or send us a message, or you can even email us at allthingshorror666 at gmail.com. That's all for today. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next one. We all go a little mad sometimes. This is my boomstick! Here's Johnny! I have to return some